Welcome to module 11. In this module, we're going to continue to look at solutions and the thermodynamics of solutions. In the previous module, module 10, we considered solutions of two liquids which might be miscible across the full range of their proportions and studied ideality and non-ideality. In this module, we want to focus more on a, another typical situation, which is that there is some minority component, a significant minority, which may be a solid, in fact, dissolved into a solution, and we call that minority component a solute. It doesn't have to be a solid, it could be a liquid as well, but in any case, present at a much smaller concentration, if you will, and uh, look at the thermodynamics of these systems in particular. So, solutions with solutes, that's where we'll begin. And as I said, we've really considered a, a solution to be something that can range from a pure component one all the way to a pure component two. What's more typical is that one has a single component, which we'll call the solvent, which is present in a much higher concentration, and the solute, the minority component, will only dissolve into the liquid solution up to a certain extent. And so the flask, for instance, that's shown here as an example, has something that has reached its solubility limit. The additional solid will not go into the solution. And so at equilibrium, we know that the chemical potential of something in all phases is identical, so we know the chemical potential of the pure solid must be equal to the chemical potential of the solid dissolved into the liquid. And the reason understanding these kinds of thermodynamics may be particularly important, a good example is within the context of pharmaceuticals. So if one wants to deliver a drug, for instance, to an individual after he or she has swallowed that drug, it's quite important to know what is the solubility, which is driven by the chemical potential, of that drug in the various phases of the body that the, the molecules of the drug might encounter. So that could be the, the acidic aqueous environment of the gut, it could be the more lipid-like oily environment of membranes that need to be crossed as a drug goes towards its target. And so these kinds of thermodynamics which dictate what's called bioavailability are tremendously important to, for instance, the pharmaceutical industry. And of course there are many other examples as well. And because we're working with two components that do not span the entire purity range, the entire mole fraction range from zero to one, it's often useful to work in units of concentration that are not, in fact, mole fraction. And in fact, the two units that we'll focus on primarily are the molality scale and the molarity scale. And you, so you see those two differ by only a single letter, so one has to be somewhat careful in pronunciation, which I'll, I'll certainly try to be. Um, I, most people watching this video are almost certainly familiar with molarity, which is something one encounters very early on in chemistry as a means to express concentration. Molality may be a little less common, but it has certain features which make it convenient. And so, the different choices that we use for describing concentration, which is to say the relative proportion of solvent and solute, are part of a standard state, and they really need to be kept track of. So when we discuss thermodynamic quantities and have real numbers involved, it's always very important to know to what standard state are these numbers calibrated. And uh, that's just, you know, a word to the wise when one is looking at numbers to be, sh be sure one understands what that little superscript zero for standard state is really implying. So let's consider then the, the three possibilities, mole fraction, which we've seen up till now, molality, and molarity. So mole fraction, uh, which we've worked with to date, the mole fraction x sub 2, so I'll make 2 my, my solute component if you like, that's the number of moles of two divided by the total number of moles in the system. And we know that that's a unitless quantity, it's moles over moles, and it can span from zero to one. Zero when there's none of the minority component present, one if it's the pure phase. Molality, by contrast, is the number of moles of the minority component, the solute, I'll say from now on, the number of moles of the solute in one kilogram, so mass, of the solvent. And so the units on that are moles per kilogram, and it's implied that you mean per kilogram of solvent. 
And the, the quantity itself can range from zero, no solute, to infinite if you really could somehow dissolve as many moles as you want into that one kilogram of solvent. Note that it doesn't say that the final solution weighs one kilogram. Molality is rather easy to put together in the sense that you just grab a kilogram of solvent and you take a certain number of moles of your solute and you dump those moles in and now you have your solution of known molality even though its density may have changed and its total mass almost has to have changed if you've added something. So the conversion between those, it's just algebra. I won't attempt to make it look intuitive, but if you want to convert from molality to mole fraction, for example, the key feature you'll need to know is what's the molecular weight of the solvent because you know how much it weighs. If you know its molecular weight, then you know how many moles of it you have. And I'll let you work out the algebra that shows that's how you'd end up with mole fraction. Molarity, by contrast, is it looks a bit like molality in the sense that you pick some given number of moles of a solute, but you then dissolve those into one liter of solution, and that's one liter of final solution. So it's not that you take one liter of your solvent and then add your moles. That might cause the volume to contract. It might cause the volume to expand. One doesn't know. Instead, what one does is arrange for the final solution volume to be one liter. And so typically that might involve a few different steps. First you'd put in a little less than a liter and you'd look at how much volume is there and then you'd add a little more solvent until it comes up to a liter as an example. Uh, the units on that are moles per liter of solution. And again, there is a conversion that can be done between, say, molality and molarity. Again, it's pretty much algebra. One needs to know the density of the resulting solution that uh, came from your molar quantity, and you also need to know the molecular weights again. And so that's really all I want to go over in this particular video. I'm going to let you take a moment to work with these various definitions and uh, determine Let's take a certain amount of table sugar, sucrose that is, 838.6 grams as a matter of fact, with a certain amount of water, 471.7 milliliters, and when you mix those together, you get a liter of solution. So you see that's a huge amount of sugar, right? The, the volume of the solution went from less than, a less than half a liter to an entire liter, so that's because we added a lot of sugar. Um, one bar and 298 Kelvin. So the question is, what's the mole fraction? What's the molality and what's the molarity of that sucrose solution? So I'll let you spend some time to work that out. So here you have all the worked out example and I'll let you take a look at that. And as uh, the slide notes, you might also wanna just verify for yourself that the conversion uh, equations that were provided earlier also take you from one to another. And that's it for this particular video. Next, we're going to look at how these concentrations affect standard states.